Okay, so today Matt and I are going to talk about some productivity books that we read about how to work better. But I want to spend the first 10 minutes or so just making fun of Timothy Ferris because we've probably covered almost 50 books on this podcast that we've read together. And the four hour work week is probably the single worst one of these that I've read. I don't know why you feel so strongly about it. I remember I read the four hour work week a few years ago and I thought there were parts of it that were farcical, but I didn't have such strong negative feeling about it. It feels like if you wanted to write a book, but only wanted to spend four hours a week, <laughs> but you only wanted to spend four hours a week writing it, this is what would come out. Yeah, that is what it, that is it. <laughs> But it's funny. That makes it funny. Because, okay, so the premise of this book by Tim Ferriss. So if you don't know Tim Ferriss, he's kind of, um, he's become famous because he has probably one of the most popular podcasts in the world. It's like mm. one of the time 10 most popular podcasts. And he just interviews people that have achieved excellence in some field. So he'll interview like athletes and entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, yada, yada, yada. And it's actually a pretty interesting podcast. But I never like knew who Timothy Ferriss was or like why he has this podcast to begin with. So the four hour work week is kind of what put him on the map is he wrote this book about, and it's just, it's, oh my God, okay, where do I start? It's such a funny, like, huckster premise of, here, just work four hours a week, and everything in your life will come to fruition. Like, that's it. I've solved it. You work too much. Yeah, the cover has a hammock and a palm tree, <laughs> I believe. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, be oh man, it's so ridiculous. So this entire book, is about Timothy Ferris's like philosophy on work and life. And the philosophy comes down to just don't work and just travel around the world doing awesome stuff. And like the style that it's written in is so I, I called it like a Diet Coke Hunter S. Thompson. As if someone like read Hunter S. Thompson, watered it down, and maybe even apple juice because Diet Coke has caffeine in it, so maybe not even that much. Where he'll just be like Oh, man, and then I'm in Thailand, and I'm at a Muay Thai fight, and it's like, yeah. And then I'm in China, and I'm in a kickboxing tournament, and now I'm on a mountain. How'd I get on that mountain? You don't even know. <laughs> I kind of like it, though, because it's so meta. So he's writing this book about how to teach people to be like him, and his advice is just be like me. And then it's so, you know, recursive. So he's like, I'm writing a book. And I sell it to these people who buy it because they want to be like me because I'm writing a book that I'm selling it to people that want to be like me. And it like funds my travel all around the yeah, world. Yeah, that's exactly it. He's just like, here's the solution to everything. Don't work. Don't answer email. Cut all your clients. No, it's not that. It's hilarious, yeah. actually. So it's funnier than that because so, okay, honestly, I think he's awesome. It's like, so he's like, basically, I don't like writing letters to like my mom or my colleagues. So I just outsource it to India. And it's just like, Wow, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> okay, but it's just, oh man. So like he'll say these anecdotes in the book. So like he, I guess, taught a class at Princeton or something. And like people, students will come into his class and he's like, here's your assignment for the week. You need to write a letter to Bill Clinton and get him to respond. And then people will be like, that's impossible. And then no one will do it. And he's like, pathetic. And it's just, I can't understand if he's just like being completely ridiculous or he's like making one of those social commentaries about the lack of agency that people have. He's like, well, you know what? You probably could have done this if you tried harder. And that's like the point. He's yeah. like performance art. He's like a giant performance artist. I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, I guess. But oh, man, just the way this book is written. Like, so there's, <laughs> there's a joke. There's this TV show called Nathan for you. That's one of my favorite TV shows. Oh, I know. And in one of the, it's one of my least favorite TV shows, actually. All right, we'll get into that. Okay, okay. But, um, <laughs> At one of these episodes, um, he has somebody ghostwrite a book for him, and he gives him a weekend to write a book. And he's like, how do you write a book in a weekend? You just start, like, listing stuff. So he'll be like, I was in college, and I loved pizza. The ingredients for pizza are, and just, like, list the ingredients. That's the way I felt this book was written, where he'd be like, he'll be like, do you know about the, what is it called? The Parkinson effect, which is, like, the thing that work expands to fill the time that you have to do work. But he'll mm -hmm. be like, I remember when I first learned of the Parkinson's effect. It was in 11th grade, and we just had a test. The test was on mathematics. They were testing us on trigonometry. Like, he just goes into these details that are completely irrelevant to try and expand this book where he had, like, one thing to say. Oh, God, it's just ridiculous. I don't know, <laughs> though. So part of it is interesting insights that you can outsource your work to other people, the boring stuff at least. 
part of it is funny travel writing, telling the story about how he went and cheated to win a karate competition and salsa dance with a hot girl in Buenos Aires and stuff. I don't know. It wasn't that bad. In my yeah, opinion. but it, he'll also go like, um, okay, so here's the idea. You don't think you can drive a Ferrari? Yes, you can. You only need another like $10,000 a month. It's easy to make $10,000 a month, yo. And like, that's it. That There's no other point to that sequitur that he went on. It's just like... Easy to make the money to get a Ferrari. Drive a Ferrari. You know, okay. Yeah, sure. But just by virtue of the book's popularity, it's hilarious. So these are just <laughs> all the memes that people want to hear. And... Right. But that's the genius of it, right? Yeah. So so it's like, this is selling snake oil, but yeah. so many people want the snake oil that he's like validating his purpose. You know what this is like? You know? So yeah. <laughs> I was just reminded of, remember... Um, in the Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar, when yeah. Mark Anthony comes to talk and he's like, I came here to just talk a bunch of shit about Caesar. And everyone's like, all right. And then he just like, by virtue of talking all this shit about him, he actually says how great he is. I feel like we just did that to Timothy Ferris. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like that because it, it's, it's amazing. He's like, hey, everyone in the world wants to know how to stop working and like drive a Ferrari. <laughs> and then the book is just like, stop working and drive a Ferrari. That's how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> And then people buy it. It's a bit... But it's brilliant because I think his <laughs> advice is that you should just be him. And then this ties interestingly into the Cal Newport book yeah. where Cal Newport just finds all these. So Timothy Ferris also is like a, a meme, but it's a dangerous meme. If you're too dumb. So he's obviously a genius to like have done all this stuff. But there, then it's like, <laughs> it's like, don't attempt this at home, you know? But then like all these people buy this book and believe his crazy stories. And then they try it, but they're not as charismatic and crazy as him and interesting. So then they just utterly fail. And then Cal Newport, just for some weird reason, and I guess all his free time as an academic, like scoured the internet to find all the people that like attempted this Timothy Ferris-esque lifestyle blog as a career path and just utterly failed. Yeah, we're talking about this book by Cal Newport, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Where, which So the Cal Newport books I found to be really interesting, but he has this whole theory in it of this idea of career capital. So throughout your career, you amass career capital. And then control over your life which is all that timothy ferris is talking about in this book is hmm. how to have complete control over your life control is the thing that you want because then you can do all this cool interesting stuff because if you can like say you want to go hella skiing and wherever well if you go in the off season it's like not as expensive as you go in the time where everyone does it but the only way you can go in the off season is if you have control over your life right hmm. this is this like whole kind of thesis so cal newport saying that control is what everyone wants but control is a, like a kind of capital and you have to have something that you need can trade in your career for control. Mm -hmm. And like there are people that just want control for the sake of control. They're like, oh, I want control over my life. So I'm going to quit my job and like start a business. It's like, dude, you don't have any capital to trade for that control. You don't have any like deep skills that are massively valuable. So like you just want control in the abstract? No, it's like something that costs a price of, you know, competence. And there's people that don't do it. And I guess, yeah, uh, I thought that was an interesting idea because I like thinking about different kinds of capital. Like, I think I give you this rant before mm -mm. that you have, like, you can think of, like, social capital, which is the, the kind of size and control you have over your personal network. And then you have financial capital, which is the amount of money that you have. And then you have, you know, intellectual capital, which is the skills that you know how to do and, like, the depth that you know how to do it. And then these all these different kinds of capital are things that you amass. And then you can trade them for other kinds of capital. So I can trade my skill capital or my knowledge capital for financial capital. I go and like trade my, you know, intellect for money, like working at some startup or something. Mm -hmm. And then you can also, you know, do you can trade your time. Oh, yeah. So time I would think of as like some other thing that you can exchange. So you mm -hmm. can trade your time for social capital if you like go out and hang out with friends or for example. Yeah, the Peter Thiel thing also that entrepreneurs are people with more time than money and VCs are people with more money than time. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, exactly. And then the, you figure out how to do it. And then I've always thought the exchange rates between different capitals and different markets is an interesting area of Oh, thought. yeah. You said that thing about uh, the dating market in New York is very liquid. That was so funny. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was, yeah, that that is slightly tangential to the point that okay, I was okay. making. But um, the point I was making is I've always found it interesting that how different markets trade those different kinds of capital at different exchange rates. So... For example, like iOS development, I always thought of as something where skill capital trades really like high against social capital, meaning you need a lot of skills at being a good iOS developer to get any social benefit from it. You know, mm -hmm. for the most part, like all you can do is make an app for someone or give a talk at like an iOS conference. But with things like cryptocurrencies, like let's say oh, yeah. 
Bitcoin or Ethereum, you only need like a little bit of knowledge and then you can like get flown around the world to like give talks at conferences and meet all the cool people that want to know about cryptocurrencies. So it's yeah. like it trades this knowledge to skill, like this knowledge to um, social capital really cheaply, which means that people can arbitrage that exchange rate. So if you have time and you want social capital, you could just invest a little bit in knowledge capital of like Bitcoin. And then arb the small exchange rate or like the cheap exchange rate into social capital. Yeah. And because of that fact, you get this interesting dynamic of you have like scammers that are like, I just want the social capital. So I'm going to just like huckster everyone and get it. But then you have also really smart people that are like, yo, this is a great arb opportunity. Let's do it. You know? Yeah, that's true. But then the thing is, the way it's related to that dating thing is that it's very illiquid. That's why. Because people don't understand it. You know what I mean? So they can't really like there's kind of a trade when someone's listening to you give an ios talk or whatever and then there's like other people in the market who like also have this so there's like more demand or like rather there's more supply of dope ios developers in the world there's few pundits bitcoin pundits so then peter todd can put himself up as like a bitcoin pundit and like even though he has like very few contributions to the core bitcoin code base he can call himself a bitcoin core developer and he does and then people can be like oh peter todd he's like the bitcoin dude but it's like why what does that do now? You know? Yeah, I like Peter Todd, so I have no comment on that specifically. But I do see your broader point of you know, when there's low supply of something, it's really easy to, and there's like an illiquid market for it. Um, yeah, cool. Where got us on that tangent? I don't even remember. But oh yeah, I was saying about career capital. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Cal Newport has this idea of career capital, which I think is really interesting. He's saying like your investment in your career is a form of capital. And then this book, So Good That They Can't Ignore You, is about how you leverage that to your advantage. For example, that something that I thought was interesting that I never thought about before is this idea that once you get enough career capital that you can trade it for control, which means you are skilled enough that you can get autonomy over your life and your bosses will just have to be cool with it because they don't want to fire you because you contribute so much, is exactly the inflection point where your bosses want to exert their control over you. So it's like once you get really valuable is when they need you to like service them because now you have the skill and like it creates this really interesting power dynamic game that you now have to like play very consciously against them. That was interesting. What do you mean though? Can you give an example of this? Oh, it's just this. I, I So, okay, maybe this ties into the 37 Signals books, which we'll talk about it's not like in, in a bit, but just the idea of, for example, remote work or physical presence. So like a, a running theme throughout these books, which is kind of like about new age productivity, like how to be productive as, a, they call it like knowledge workers. So you're not like working on a factory assembly line. You're working in this like thing, this vague idea of knowledge work where your work is hard, your output's hard to quantify. I think that like it's not as obvious as when you're working in like manufacturing, like what your physical output is. So when you're a knowledge worker, um, physical presence is... It's not as necessary as it is for manufacturing or these kind of labor jobs, labor intensive jobs. So then there's the idea of like, do I have to be in an office, right? This is like a major question that's going to run through the theme of all of these books and a lot of kind of people thinking about work in the 21st century now. Um, and to an extent, it, it just seems like, and we'll talk about remote uh, in, a, in a little bit, but it seems like it's a lot better for the employee to be able to work remotely. Because it means that they have more control and autonomy over their career. So there is kind of a power dynamic that you have. But it seems like managers, like someone that has the role of manager, would prefer to have more control over you than you would have individually. So it's in their incentive to not have you work remotely or to have you in physical presence. So there's a kind of a power dynamic in any situation of someone wanting you to be there physically versus you wanting to not be there physically in a sense, right? I have no experience of this because I work remotely. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, so, okay, but I think that it, it's a real thing and, it, and it's interesting because it is one of the major themes of this book. And it's like this idea that once you're good enough where you could tell someone, yo, I'm going to just go to Thailand because that's what I want to do, but I'll still ship code. And if you ship good code, can't really say anything about it that's the inflection point where they're going to want to prevent you from going to thailand you know it's like an interesting power dynamic i guess but then you could just work at a company that would let you do that yeah totally i 100 percent agree with that yeah. um so i guess maybe that's a tie-in uh <laughs> yeah so 
these books, in a sense, like we kind of just crushed them all this week, but they're all really all interesting, right? They're, they're about this idea of as a knowledge worker in the 21st century, how you architect your day-to-day life to like maximize your productivity and to, I don't know, like, yeah, just like optimize your happiness, I guess, in like when that's the thing that a lot of people are after. And yeah, so the Cal Newport book, so they're so good, they can't ignore you, which talks about this idea of how to amass career capital and kind of, um, I don't know, what was the other major theme you would say of that book? So good, they can't ignore you is, yeah, as you said, about, so it was Cal Newport's kind of, what did they call this thing when Native Americans spirit quest or anything would go into the woods and figure out what they whatever to become a member of their tribe or anything I don't even know that people really did that maybe I saw it in a movie on an airplane or something but anyway I got the impression that this was well I got the impression because he kind of said it was uh, Dr. Calvin Newport's anal- like uh, how to say catalog of him going through this experience and figuring out what he wanted to do with his career as he was saying that he was in a PhD program and that he might just become a professor and stay a professor for his whole life. So he wanted to figure out what makes people happy or satisfied with their career. And so he just went around talking to different kinds of people about um, what job they did and whether they liked that career. Yeah. And it's interesting um, because I guess he like, he's on the spirit quest to figure out what he wants to do. So he just interviews a lot of people that, have what he thinks of as successful careers. He's like, how'd you do it? Like, what yeah, were the, yeah. the, the big insights? Okay, so one of the things that I thought was weird was that Dr. Calvin Newport is really vocally against Twitter and social media platforms, but he divulged in this book that he had time to TiVo a reality TV show about pawnbrokers and then rewatch <laughs> that. So <laughs> I was a little bit confused about that. Yo, I actually watched that show because of this book. I watched some pawn broker YouTubes. It's amazing. It's <laughs> so good. It's just like this pawn shop in Las Vegas where like some guy will come in and he'll be like, here's a guitar. Jimi Hendrix played it. And then they'll he'll be like, well, if Jimi Hendrix played this, this is worth a million dollars. But did he? And they have to like figure out if like Jimi Hendrix actually played this guitar. Huh. And then they'll be like, you're lying to us. And I'll be like, God damn. <laughs> it's a great show. Um. Yeah, uh, it was. It, I the one thing that, that I did like. He's talking about this guy who's a really good guitar player, mm-hmm. and he Cal Newport, I guess, also dabbled in playing guitar. And he's like, I'm not as good as you, so why are you way better than me? And he deduced that it was because of the practice regiment that this guitar player had, um, where people that get great at something or like they master a skill to a high level, they practice intentionally by practicing out of their comfort zone. It's like. He's like, okay, and I also am intimate to this because I've learned guitar over the last two years, where it's like really fun on a guitar to play a song that you know and like play it well. Mm -hmm. And it's really frustrating to try and play some riff that you don't know and can't do. And it just doesn't sound like anything. It's like non-meditative and it Mm -hmm. sucks. So it's like very easy if I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to practice guitar for an hour. I'm just going to go play cool like three chords and like, I played a song and it's awesome. But it really sucks to just be like, I'm going to stretch my hand in some weird way and fuck up this riff like a hundred times and not make any progress. But the people that are actually great, they do this thing that calls like stretch and destroy. Where like you step like a little bit out of your comfort zone just to stretch your skill set. And like you're constantly doing that. You're not like too far out of your skill set. You're not, you know, and he calls this like flow state. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't know. It it was, Mm -hmm. it was uh, interesting. I felt that a lot and I feel like I need to constantly remind myself to do that, like stretch what you're actually doing. Like you could just code some web app in the exact same way every time. It's like, great, I know React, I know how to build APIs and I'm just flowing on web apps, but are like, are you getting better? Are you pushing yourself? Are you stretching? And then where's that gonna get you, you know? Yeah, it was a pretty interesting book. I actually read this book concurrently or just right after I finished that book, Mastery. And these are the two books that got me interested in becoming a really skillful programmer. Yeah, because I guess he he's not a programmer, but he seems to like have hacked on code. Or So this is one reason, though, why I was a little bit critical of Dr. Calvin Newport, because I really liked this book when I was younger and felt myself to be inspired by it. But now revisiting it, once I have some perspective, and especially, so I even went and got a 
I was pursuing a PhD in computer science because I think a large part to do with having read that book and being inspired by that. And I was like, oh, well, what is Cal and Newport doing? He's doing a PhD in computer science. Seems like an interesting thing to do. Anyway, so I did that. But I think that doing a PhD in computer science is a totally moronic undertaking because doing a PhD, doing research is good for science like astrophysics or anything like that because the government is the only entity that can pay for some astrophysics observing equipment you know and some company is not going to do that but for computer science it's moronic i think because computer science is just engineering so he's teaching distributed systems at georgetown or he teaches blockchain theory okay so blockchain theory what is that it's like if you have a theory of a cool blockchain build it don't like teach it to a bunch of undergraduates what does that even mean <laughs> or you know i think so it's like nobody in a phd program no computer science researchers i guess like so tim berners lee was he a researcher was he an like, academic no he wasn't or like people he worked at cern yes yeah, so but he wasn't a yeah. researcher he was a real scientist doing real science at real cern so not like a computer scientist because there's no such real thing Oh, there's also in the Richard Feynman lectures. He gave some lecture in Japan where he was like, yeah, computer scientists call themselves scientists, but they're not. They're just engineers, which is totally true. It's like, oh, I wonder if uh, this will work. So I feel like what it is is that people who go into this field of academic computer science research are not good enough at math to do some real interesting mathematics research and are, I don't know, too ivory toweristic to be in the real world. So they just do this weird research like semantic web stuff nobody cares about this the only people that support it are governments and i think the only reason they support that is because what is semantic web? what is it's like this big computer science research topic that the group that i was in in germany is interested in studying it's this bogus thing like idea for how the internet could work out which it didn't work out like that that was popular in like the 90s and it's dead no one actually uses it in the real world but all of these academics still study it I think it's crazy. Yeah, I, I feel that. So I actually had the experience at multiple times in my career of working with, um, working on computer science problems with people from academia, and the mindset is like vehem like it's like almost a dichotomy difference with people that are more of the hacker mindset, which is like let's build code, ship it, and solve real problems, whereas the academic mindset is like let's solve hypothetical problems, and it doesn't matter if people use it or if they're real because. I can define the problem in like formal notation and then I need to yeah. sign it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. I'm way more on the hacker side. So I also tend to look down on academia as just like clownish in a sense. But obviously when you get in like, I, but then it's like the thing that when you get into the real weeds and it's like, I actually need this algorithm to work at, you know, ON or whatever, like you actually need that kind of stuff. But it, it's like few and far between. It's like there, it's more of a specialty. It's not a day to day kind of thing that you need yeah i don't know yeah but anyway um before we get too off topic so i i tend to share your skepticism with people that did a phd in computer science like as like a career trajectory to model is like idealistic because i'm much more of a practical person but i did like um so good they can't agree and i also like deep work a lot so deep work um which is also kind of interesting when we're talking about like so like, it's like timothy ferris branded the four hour work week as like his thing and like it's his mm. like cool brand or whatever even though it's just a ridiculous premise um but deep work is also kind of like this where like i see this meme all the time now of things called deep work and i assume it comes from this book or deep Cal learning i think it's like deep everything deep is cool so there's like <laughs> yeah. deep learning in computer science <laughs> yeah yeah he's obviously into this and so he's like I feel like his main thing, though, is coming up with good memes. Like, I haven't read any of his academic papers, but many of them have few citations. And like the, his most cited paper, he's not the first author on it. And if you're not the first author on a paper in academia, it means that it's not really your paper. Because when people cite it, they don't cite Newport, blah, blah, blah. They cite the first author at all. So he's just part of the at all, blah, blah, blah. And he knows it. And so does every other academic. It's interesting. It's an interesting field. Yeah, academia is weird because it's like artificial in a sense. It's like you're judged in how good an academic you are is by how good an academic people think you are. It's very so, arrogant. Yeah. Oh, and it's very, yeah. so they talk in academia about prestigiousness. So it's a very um, superficial, vapid discipline, I think. Yeah, but I like this book though, because in this whole idea of deep work is 
So it's something that I've organically discovered myself, which is I randomly find myself able to be highly productive when I'm in hotel rooms. And it's just something that's naturally occurred throughout my life or on airplanes. Like I've coded some real crazy stuff on airplanes and like just been killed it for five hours. And it's like, okay, it's very obvious because there's no distractions or something like that. You're in an exotic place where like you don't know people. No one's going to call you that like Hmm. you don't you're not checking your phone all the time. Um, and this book is all about that meme. It's the, all about the meme of someone that like isolates themselves to get things done. And then how that is something that's gone out of fashion because we're like constantly distracted. And then like it talks in depth about like how your brain forms skills to begin with, which I thought was really interesting. It's like basically neurons in your brain will coalesce as a group whenever you're doing something. And it's like the myelin sheath around it somehow. Um, I, I'm going to botch the science on it, but the idea of it is interesting. Like say you're playing pool and you want to get good at pool. Yeah. Like there's some neuron formation in your brain that like when you hit a shot and hold it properly, like they're formed in some, you know, yeah, yeah. specific this structure. Law thing. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the yeah, first yeah. thing you learn in a class on neural networks or something like that. Oh, like you mean like for computer science? Neural yeah, networks. it's like, like you yeah. Newport went to a class of some dude that was teaching yeah, yeah. neural science or like <laughs> cognitive neural nets or something like that or computational neural nets or whatever. And he was like, oh, Hebb's Law. I'll write that down. I'll put it in my book. <laughs> Yeah, but it is, like, but the idea of it is, okay, so the more you, like, train something, the more those neurons actually become wired together. Yeah, sure. So it's, like, but the idea is that they don't have time to form those connections if you are, like, the more stimulus you have. So if I'm playing pool but checking my phone also, it's, like, they're too disparate to actually form that, like, ring around them. So dig this. He yeah. also, I believe the guy was named Nicholas Carr, this book called The Shadows, which you would totally like. I sent it to you. It's all about Marshall McLuhan and how the internet is changing our brains. So Cal Newport also mentioned it in that deep work book. But a lot of the ideas also come from that. And also, I remember in one episode we were talking about Noam Chomsky and how he has a bad writing style because he seems like he's going to get graded on it, like all this time citing his references and everything. And I felt that this book was a little bit of the same. Oh, that it was too academic and not... Or, uh... It was written in, at least in that same kind of Noam Chomsky in style. Yeah, that's true. But I felt, okay, it, yes in some sense, but also maybe no in the sense that it wasn't, um, it wasn't like citing sources like constantly as a bibliography, like in each chapter, the way that the Noam Chomsky like writing felt like. But, but anyway, um, okay, sorry. I don't want to get too into like railing on academia because I feel like there are other interesting ideas in these books that we should talk about. Um, okay, cool. Oh yeah. I like this idea too, that he said journalism's bad because it doesn't involve deep work anymore. It's like, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like, real journalism requires deep work. It's like some one dude chasing one company for, like, two years to, like, find everything about it. And now it's, like, disparate and, like, people chasing a million different tales but not getting, like, deep in anything. Kind of interesting. I also think that the meme of quitting social media is funny because it's, like, it's almost, this is the, if you were just trying to be a thought leader and you didn't have anything interesting to say but you just had to really quickly hack it, you'd be like, "Uh, quit social media. You know why he hates Timothy Ferris? Because they're the same person. Like, their books are the same. So Timothy Ferris is like, hey, want to have a cool life? Be just like me. And Cal Newport's like, hey, want to have a cool life? Be just like me. (laughs) Every example of how cool his life is is talking about himself. He's like, yeah, I walk to work every day across this cool bridge in Boston. And then I sit down and I write these papers. And I have kids and all this stuff. My life is so cool. It's like, (laughs) Timothy Ferris is like, yo, want to be like me and rock out? And Cal Newport's like, want to be like me and publish a bunch of papers? (laughs) Just study this. (laughs) You know? He's like, all right, if Timothy, I mean, he's like, he's like the Diet Coke of Timothy (laughs) Paris. Oh, man. All right. You want to talk? Okay. Oh, man, we're all over the place here. Okay. Um, You want to talk about 37 Singles? Because these books are actually really interesting also. Yeah. So we read two 37 Singles books, which one is called Remote, Office Not Required. That's co-published by DHH and Jason Freed. And one's called... What was it? It doesn't have to be crazy at work. So, wait, what? It doesn't have to be crazy at work, isn't it? We, we read remote, and it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, okay. So, Thirty Seven Signals. They are also really interesting characters in the tech startup ecosystem. Yeah. So the basic premise goes like this: There's some dev shop in Chicago called Thirty Seven Signals, that was started by Jason Fried and some other co-founders that don't work there anymore. And they hired this guy named DHH, who was just some programmer in Denmark that was they like found him over the internet and then they started working together and he started coding in ruby because he liked ruby and then realized there wasn't a good web framework for it and wrote this web framework called ruby on rails which became massively successful and like 
for like a five year period, like ran the internet. And now it's like much more of a competitive ecosystem, but it had like a real, real moment in time. And he became a rock star and famous and like made millions of dollars from this. And because of that, people started using 37 Signals products, which they made like a suite of products, one of which was something called Basecamp, which is like a glorified project management software. Um, it's actually completely terrible. And that is a kind of white elephant of reading all of these mm-hmm. books. But um, yeah, so they made this thing and it became successful because everyone knew Jason Fried and DHH. And then they all became millionaires. And now they just kind of like shit on Silicon Valley because they're like, hey, we didn't raise any money. We just, you know, invented the most popular web framework. So, you know, why doesn't everyone do that? And like they write all these books about their working style and how successful they are. And it's again, man, it's like, okay. So first off, I have a personal relationship with 37 Signals because I lived in Chicago for 18 months. And I went to um, the first ever coding boot camp, which was called Code Academy, which was in Chicago. And it was like run orthogonally with 37 Signals. And I had been to their offices before. And it was so interesting how many people that came to Chicago to this program knew of 37 Signals. They're like, we are learning to code because, and we're learning Rails because we like 37 Signals. We like their style. Because hmm. um, they had written this book called Rework that had started... That was like way back when they first started. Super interesting. But the whole premise of their entire writing is that everything Silicon Valley does is wrong. Like the whole startup idea is just off. Raise money, go into debt, try to build a product that grows fast is wrong. You should invest in your employees. You should work more, you know, like a kind of European company that values their employees and has four day work weeks. Mm. And you should just build one product that is revenue positive from the start. And they, they make a lot of good counterpoints to the typical venture capital funded Silicon Valley startup. But it's just really interesting to read their perspective on things because there's like an elephant in the room. Like DHH is this rock star developer that has a super hot wife and lives on like a beach in Spain and drives a Ferrari and races cars. And he just writes these books and he's, I don't understand why people go into an office and work really hard when they could just, you know, bang their hot wife and race cars and live on a beach in Spain, just and invent the most popular web framework in the world. Like, I just don't understand it. And that's what these, and it's almost like you want to bang your head against the wall at just how missing the point they are about everything. But then at some point you're thinking, you know what, why don't I just live in Spain and race cars? Because that sounds awesome. You know, like maybe they're actually making a really good point that about that perceived lack of agency, which is kind of the point that runs through all these things. Maybe they are actually right. Maybe people just need to take more like autonomy over their life and find more higher leverage things to work on so that they can have that lifestyle. Mm, maybe, like know. maybe the whole point is there, you know? I think it relates to that Cal Newport thing, though, of so good they can't ignore you ism, which uh, he says he also got from the Steve Martin biography, which I bought and started to read. So, I don't know. I think that's an interesting idea. We were also talking about... Rem- so, we talked on this podcast before about why people don't write manifestos, because we want to read more manifestos. I felt like remote was a sort of manifesto. Oh, actually, so you said this to me earlier, and I replied that I thought that until the very end of the book, Remote, when they pitched their crappy software product. So, basically, <laughs> the whole book, I thought I was reading this whole thing about being remote, blah, blah, blah. And then and they're like, yeah, and if you want to be remote, you can try our software product. And it's just like, oh, my God, was this just a giant infomercial that I just experienced? Yeah, they make one point in remote. That thing is really good. So their thesis is that remote work is totally on the upswing. And it's because of technological change, mm-hmm. which I also thought was interesting. So because collaboration tools have just finally hit the cusp where it's actually – functional to do WebEx hangouts and you have all these Mm -hmm. tools like Slack and things like this because the technology got better remote work is like completely enabled for information workers yeah totally my company fully does it and I think one interesting thing about this book remote was that they started the book off by sniping at Yahoo and saying that Yahoo ended their remote work program which I thought was hilarious because I feel as if if Yahoo does or did something that's an anti-pattern and that you should do the opposite thing. Did you read that Marissa Meyer essay that they talked about? No, I didn't. So she wrote an essay. I forget what it's called. But there was some essay she wrote about ending the remote program. And it's just hilariously bad. Mm. And yeah, yeah you should. It seems 
ludicrous. Because they, because the whole point was that they, when she became CEO, she like looked at the email server logs, and found that the remote employees were logging into their email server logs less than the employees that were in the office, and used that as justification to cut the entire remote working. Yeah, yeah, that's what they said. And they were like, "That's great that they're not checking their email because that's unproductive." Yeah, true. So like their thesis was that was actually a positive signal. Hilarious. But anyway, the idea of it is so interesting, right? So the idea of remote work is that if you're a company and you say you're in New York City or San Francisco and you hire developers in New York City and San Francisco, one, you have to pay them a lot because the cities are expensive to live in. Mm -hmm. And two, it's really competitive. So if you have a software developer that is really good and he works at Dropbox, but then he leaves and he wants to work at your startup, then there's some other startup that he could just go work at. It's like competitive. So, you know, they're always thinking about what's the best move for my career, yada, yada, yada. But if you hire someone in Kansas City, there's no companies in Kansas City or there's less of them that are trying to poach that employee. So you can get better job security out of your employees, especially if you pay them the rate of the big city. So you could say, okay, we're going to pay you a New York City rate, even though you live in Kansas City, which is higher than any company in Kansas City is going to pay you. And you have less competition for being poached by competitors, which means that you're going to like almost have lock-in to working at our company, which is a way smarter strategy. Yeah, golden handcuffs. Yeah, which is a way smarter strategy than playing this crazy... Golden hand job. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that point was excellent. It's like, why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't you invest? Like, It's almost strategic to pay more money to people in less competitive areas so they're locked into you than to try to pay people in high competitive areas that could just go to a different company. But the thing is really smart cool and interesting people move to areas where there's higher wages <laughs> <laughs> tbh right but but if and then that's why this book is hilarious because it's well hey we invented the most popular web framework so people want to work for us so why don't you just do that you know yeah that's I the theme of the book this book is highly dubious in many ways but i think that one uh interesting so there was a lot of profanity also which I found distasteful. <laughs> but another thing, <laughs> another thing is that it's just a sexy word for outsourcing. It's like, yeah, they used to have remote workers in Bangalore. It was called outsourcing. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like it, it's not like outsourcing. It is outsourcing. It's no, because thing. you outsourcing is you don't even care who the people doing it are. It's just like some black box. I feel like remote work is you're investing in your employees and they can just work from anywhere. But you still have like a very personal relationship with the person doing the work. I guess they're kind of related. I think, man, I'm so I'm a massive fan of remote work, and this is an interesting thing in my own personal career, which is. So I've worked in some situations where I had to be in an office nine to five, even though I was writing code and I absolutely despise it because I do not write good code in an office. I don't want to be around anyone when I'm coding and mm -hmm. I'll collaborate with people when I have to, but I want to be at my battle station mm -hmm. in my apartment, like working. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just become a massive power dynamic, I feel like, of trying to convince people that this is a beneficial thing to do. And it's just going to be going forward. And the question is like, when have you amassed enough career capital to like effectively do this? Or just work at consensus my company is fully remote yo i like this idea too they say this that cool companies that are cool with remote work are just cool in general okay, which i also, also dig this i yeah. really also like having an office that i can go to sometimes to hang out with people but 37 signals has an office yeah so i think having an office is good but they, like he says it's a it's a it's a luxury it's not a necessity i like that too i guess so an office is a luxury for companies to have you don't yeah, need to have an office sense. but it's just like a good thing to have when you're a good company yeah, yeah totally yeah, I, I freaking can believe this. Okay, this other book um, that they wrote. Uh, Doesn't oh, have to be crazy at work. Yeah, yeah. terrible, oh, terrible uh, book. Yeah, so <laughs> the, this one was not as good. I liked remote. I thought it was really good because I like manifestos. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. It was just straight counter signaling popular memes from Silicon Valley yeah. to the point where it was itself just a joke. Where they would like literally, this is the book in Silicon Valley. They have FOMO, the fear of oh, missing yeah. out. We have Jomo, the joy of missing out. Oh, yeah, which I thought was funny because I was like, joy, that's a weird word. They should have called it happy. But then I was like, oh, wait, homo. <laughs> In Silicon Valley, people have to-do lists. We have to-don't lists. <laughs> <laughs> this is the whole book. This is the whole book. It's so bad. And Jason Fried's Twitter account is literally just retweeting people that talk about how great this book is. It's so funny. Mm. But it's again, man, okay, so all three of these authors, it's just 
selling snake oil. But, but, or is it? Or is it? That's the interesting question. Because their whole thesis, like, okay, Basecamp is not a good product. It's terrible. It's, a, it's like a really bad to-do list management like software. Worse than Jira? Worse than Jira. Oh, my God. It, it, like, it's so uninteresting and unremarkable. And then just because they invented this awesome web framework. It's also kitschy. Which I don't like. When you go to their website, there's a bunch of happy campers and stuff. It's like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> a PBS special? But it's just insane because Rails is so awesome. And if... Debatable. <laughs> yeah. But like, if you, if you created this web framework, you could live this awesome lifestyle regardless of how ridiculous your to-do list software is. But they just like d- ignore that part. <laughs> They're just like... Uh, does Rails make money though? It's open source. Yeah, but it doesn't matter, man. You, I, it, you, you're so... Are they like consultants or something? Yeah, t- 100%. Like Red Hat? Okay. Well, that's... I mean, I don't know. If, I don't think they do that personally. I think Basecamp just makes a lot of money because people know it because DHH is so famous hmm. that people use his software. You know, but it, it's completely unremarkable software it's just mm. that he it's like marketing like Real- paris hilton's reality show yeah something like this uh, that's what i honestly got it have you ever met one person that uses base camp and likes it because no. i've literally never Me met either. a single person no. and i hung out around that ecosystem for a really long time huh. i don't know a single person that uses this software and actually think it's good and then their website when they do testimonials they talk about churches use it to organize their baseball league. you know it's great yeah. you sell to church ad <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah there's a bunch of dubious advice in there so they don't sell licenses they charge everyone the same amount which is 250 dollars or some crazy number like this i don't know and they're optimizing for meeting the small businesses i don't know something like this yo but check this out so i making fun of them but i did really like remote um they also made this other point so a lot a lot of remote is not just the manifesto for why remote work is good but it's actually advice about how to work remotely like well as a team Mm. and they made two points that i thought were really interesting so one of them was it's really important to have like an executive, like a CXO that's remote or else like oh, yeah. your company will bifurcate into the remote employees versus the non-remote employees mm-hmm. and the non-remote employees will always just like circumvent them and make them feel like second class citizens. Second grade citizens. Yeah, because, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they'll say things like, well, you know, John and I discussed this in person and we decided X and you weren't there for it. So your input's not, you know, and like that's totally happens. Example from totally, the book. totally happens. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, one of my colleagues was remote, and we have this office in Brooklyn, and he was um, feeling this one day. He was complaining to me that, oh, yeah, that company is not a remote-first company. It's just a remote-also company. And I was like, zing, nice one. <laughs> but I guess I know what you mean. Oh, uh, wait, hold on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. also... Um... What was the, the point I was making? Yeah, yeah, but they said if you have like a CXO of the company that mm-hmm. is remote, then you know that you won't get into that situation because they'll just be, yo, I'm also remote, so if I'm not included, then no one's included kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I also like this idea they had about the broken windows theory of email. So they said when you are remote, a lot of conversations like happen on email and whatever, and you can't resolve issues as well because people, it's like being on Twitter, you know, everyone's really mean to each other because they're anonymous and like faceless and stuff. Yeah. So they do like the the broken windows theory of policing. When there's one broken window, you immediately patch it because you don't want like mess to coalesce. Yeah. So if like one person even tries to be like passive aggressive in an email, you immediately say, "What the hell is this?" You know, like you're like so on the top of the whole point of passive aggressiveness though is that no one notices <laughs> except for the person that's supposed to affect. You know what I mean? How could they do that? That sounds crazy to me. Because could you imagine what kind of a crazy terror police state that would be? It's like, whoa, <laughs> what was that period doing there in that email? It's like. Relax, dude. <laughs> like whose job that would be? Jeez. Yeah, but I, I like the idea though of just monitoring. Like, if you're a remote first company, it's really important to make sure email conversations don't devolve. Kind of, you know. It, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah, I understand this point, but I don't feel like it's weird. That was a weird, like, chapter. I don't know. All right, what other thoughts do you have about these buildings? <clears throat> Basically, Cal Newport is, writes good books, which are smart. But uh, I don't know. The examples in them. So I feel like with Deep Work, for instance, he made the point in the first, I don't know. I don't know pages because I only listen to audiobooks. But in the first, what, 40 minutes, it's like, okay, I get it. He tells, like, the Carl Jung story. Nice. And then it's just, like, more and more examples. And then just, like, all these weird strategies, like taking a calendar and making red X's on it, which he heard from Jerry Seinfeld. 
<laughs> just okay that's i actually I like that idea though the idea is that you get a calendar and you put it in your room and it's very visible so you have to look at it all the time and then you just throw a massive red x on every day where you did the thing you want to do go to the gym ship code you know work on your comedy <laughs> routine and i know then, but come and then on. you have to look at it you just have to look at it come on though this is like so grasping at straws like you were getting at tim ferris for like <laughs> trying to like bloat his book <laughs> cal newport's like uh, okay. uh you can get a calendar and put x's <laughs> on it and you can uh <laughs> it's like come on bro Yo, the tim ferris, okay i got the point of the tim ferris book after 15 minutes and there's still like eight hours and it's uh, it's just getting so ridiculous of copy and pasting things yeah, but there's funny Aaron and the thing like about when he sold flying steroids to in magazines to teenagers. <laughs> the thing about flying to Thailand is if you fly in the air on a plane. Hey, you want to talk about plane? Like it's just filler. For- oh, and then he has this whole anecdote about how he couldn't sell his book to a publisher. He got like rejected from 26 publishers and now the 27th publisher to publish it. And this is supposed to be like some commentary on his tenacity. It's like your book sucks. <laughs> That's why they rejected it. Maybe if you spent more time on the book, you would get it. Maybe. It's so, it's so bad. I really have absolutely no respect for Tim Ferriss after reading this. <laughs> oh, man. But, like, just the idea is just so seductive. I have, yo, I like this idea in deep work also. There's a couple more things I want to say. I really like this idea of being comfortable with being bored. So Cal Newport says that when you get bored is when your mind wanders and people get bored frequently. So it's like, oh, I'm bored. Let me play video games or something. Mm-hmm. And then you're distracted. But if you can like make yourself comfortable with being bored, then you're not like, you're like, oh, I'm bored. That's just the thing. But then you don't get distracted because you're just okay with that idea of it. And then you just go back to whatever you're working on. I don't think I've been bored since I was 16, sitting in high school class and just being so bored. But... I feel like that now there's so many interesting things that I could think about all the time. I'm never bored. Yeah, I don't know. I but I know, I get that feeling. It's like when I'm actually bored, like sitting in an office, for example, you just you're not going to do anything productive. You're going to do something distracting. But if I was cooler with being bored and just like I would do less distracting things. I think that's a completely valid point that I need to think more about. Hmm. I also like this idea he had of a sender filter for emails. So, he had an idea that you filter out the sender of your email by making them go through steps to like contact you. So I forget what he said. Like on his website, he says, Hey, I see that like, th- like it's his email address and there's like some form to fill out. It's like, make sure when you email me, it does these three things. And if you don't do those things, it like automatically gets filtered out. So he's like making sure that the people that wanted to contact him, like went through hoops to do it. I kind of, yeah, like I mean, this is a typical thing that I see many academics have done on their papers or rather on their websites, their personal websites, which for some reason, professional academics always have the dumbest <laughs> personal websites. But uh, <laughs> a lot of them will be like, yeah, include this in the subject line of your email or I won't read it. Yeah. Okay, dude. I like it. Yo, what do you think about this idea? Google makes your memory worse because you can just Google things, but then it reduces your need for a good memory also. Yeah, I think that's true. And then you can devote your mind to higher level things, like a calculator. Calculators make you, I guess, arguably worse at doing simple arithmetic or long division or whatever by hand. But then they free your mind to focus on way more interesting stuff, like integrals and so on. Yeah, what do you think about this idea? Unfinished tasks take up the most thought. They dominate your attention. I think that's actually a really deep point that Deep Work made. Like, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I kind of like it, though. Uh, Unfinished tasks dominate your attention. And that's one of the reasons why things like to-do lists and all this kind of stuff. Or maybe they don't, and that's why they're unfinished. Yeah, but then you think about it more. Like, Do you? I totally do. Totally do. If there's something that I think I'm supposed to do and I haven't done it yet, I think about it constantly. Yeah, maybe. And that distracts from deep work. So deep work is just, you know, I don't have all these tasks. I just don't care about them. I'm only focusing on the one thing that, like, I'm caring about. Yeah, I guess. But you also have to prioritize your tasks. I don't know. All right. Cool. Any other thoughts about these books? Yeah. I enjoyed all of them. So I found value in them. Although I'm critical of them. But I feel like that's active reading. If you're actively engaged in a book, then you find ways to criticize it. You're not just polyannically 
into everything they write. I thought the idea of being intentional about your career and the way that you work and having like is, is a good idea in general. But chances are, if you want to be intentional about it, you don't really know where to start. I thought reading these books is actually a pretty good framework about what you should be aiming for. Um, like you see the lifestyle you want to emulate, you get some grounding in the common debates and like talking points around either side so that you feel like you could go to combat with them if you had to. The, the Cal Newport books are good. I'm glad that I read them. The 37 Signals books are good. I'm glad I read them. I, I've been following them for a while though. So I'm like familiar with those kind of talking points. I really do believe remote work is going to just be a massive kind of wave. And there's going to be like probably like everything, like business opportunities around remote work, you know, like yeah. we work. For example, they specifically didn't mention WeWork. This was fascinating to me when they were listing at the end all of these that things. That is interesting. You know, so I was thinking those other places, like they kept saying this weird thing, like Rafer or something like that, or Regis or something. Dumb well, they like showed that. this app called Desk Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, like, I know the guys that made this. Paid by this. Yeah, 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 they're in Chicago. They're Chicago startup. So there's there's some shilling. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so but I feel like that will be a real thing, and it's good to think about it if you want to think about like potential business opportunities. Like remote work is going to be a trend. Um, and it also is going to make like a class society of, oh, you're not good enough to work remotely. Ooh. Oh, in my <laughs> building. So yeah. they did a survey about this. I live in some bougie apartment building and there's a big residence lounge and they gave us this survey. And one of the questions they wanted to know was who works remotely or who works from home? Because a lot of people in the building do and then just go up there and work all day. Yeah, it's a status thing. Is it though? I feel like it's just a smart thing. But it also kind of sucks. Like a convenience thing. So it is a status thing, I think, for sure. Because it means you have control over your life. And control is a status thing in this era, for sure. But I think that it also kind of sucks to just sit alone at your computer all day when you could just be, like, social and meet people and make business connections kind of thing. I guess, though. But so going to the office is sometimes very annoying. Because, for instance, especially these open office plans that are popular these days where you have to sit near a bunch of business guys who are on the phone talking about oh uh is the meeting for the, about the meeting scheduled before or after the next meeting are you coming to that meeting it's just like oh my god man please shut up <laughs> you know what i mean i know literally exactly what you mean because yeah. i can picture this <laughs> yeah uh but what was my f okay so i was saying that is an interesting thing the tim ferris book is just absolutely hilarious like i kept reading it just because i was cracking up it's just it's just how insane of a concept this is. dude literally the concept of this book is work less make more money bro <laughs> <laughs> fantastic advice i like it drive a ferrari it's not that expensive yo you think it's expensive it's two hundred thousand dollars but what is that a month an extra 10k a month for two years that's nothing perfect <laughs> thanks tim <laughs> I, like it. I have to listen to his podcast. I've listened to some of his episodes of his podcast, and they're quite good. But then I listened to one he did with Tony Robbins, who's also a huckster, and mm. it was hilarious. Just listening to the two hucksters, huckster, and uh, amazing. Okay, I'm done. I have nothing else to say about these books. Do you have anything else to say? No, I don't. If you made it to the end of this, congratulations. Um, we're still experimenting with things. We're going to get a third microphone, and we're going to start having guests on this podcast. We also live streamed this episode for the first time, and somebody actually did write a comment in the comment thread, which is great. Amazing. Because we didn't advertise this at all. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're going to do a sci fi month in February. Oh, yeah. Three Body Problem. Get on it. <laughs> Read the Three Body Problem. It's epic. We're going to do a whole month where we just cover sci fi books. So that's going to be really good. And we're going to do a live event called the Book Retreat in March at some point. Book Conf. So it's Millennial Davos. <laughs> Get at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be back doing this. Peace. Later.